Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hillsdale Church. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Would you all stand and let's pray together as we get started with worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts that we are able once again to lift up your name, to worship you, to learn more about your character. And I ask this morning that you would help us be open to whatever you have for us this morning. That we would be open to receiving your comfort. That we would be open to receiving your correction. No matter what it is, or some kind of combination of both. That we would be both aware of your presence and willing to receive what you have to offer. And at the same time, ready to give you what we have. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and the gift of your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but you brought me, you know his love for me, oh his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh is free and I'm a child. Let the king of my heart 
be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, 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 be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my soul, the king of my heart. Be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is. Let's sing that verse again.
There's a message on the wind. Be still and know your maker. Be satisfied in him. Amen. This time y'all can be seated and I'd like to invite our children up to the stage to join Miss Christie for children's time. How is everyone today? Yay. Come on up. Good. Are you excited? It's the first week of summer. That's all I get. Nobody's excited about summer? I am. Oh, there you go. There's a few. Good. It is exciting. I'm excited for summer. Is anyone going to the beach? Any plans to go to the beach? A few of you? No, well, I already went you already went to the beach? What's your favorite thing to do at the beach? I know, I know. Play in the waves. In the waves, that's a good one. What about you? Swim with the fish. Swim with the fish. Um, play in the sand. Play in the sand. And, and, and make big sand piles. Oh, that is fun to make sand piles. What about you, Addie? At the beach when I go with my dad, I like to play in the pool or find the things that dig in the sand on the beach. She looks for things that dig in the sand. My favorite thing to do on the beach is collect seashells. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever collected shells? Have you noticed how different they all are? Can you ever find one that's the same? I brought some here with me. Just take a quick peek. We're just looking. Take a quick peek. None of them are the same size or shape. Do you notice that? They're all a little tiny bit different. And yes, I know. They are gorgeous. Look at that. That's kind of like we are, right? Are we all the same or are we all different? different different and that's how God made us he made each one of us special and unique and different very good I want to read to you Psalm 139 14 says I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful and didn't God do a wonderful job of creating all of us different yeah. yes what's something think of one thing that's different from you and your family what's something different about you can you think of something um, my brother has, like, bluish green eyes while I have brown. Good. That's a good one. Possibly sometimes age. Age? Age? Yes. Yes. Thank you for being so polite. What's your name? And I, and I have hazel eyes. You do have hazel eyes. Anybody else want to tell me? Okay. I have a pearl. You do. So we're all different, even from our family members. And that is awesome because God made us that way, special and unique. And when you go to the beach this summer, I want you to take a look at the shells and remember that God made you so special and unique, okay? We're going to say a prayer and we'll head over to Power Hour. Are you ready? Dear Lord, one second, we're going to say a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you for making each of them just so wonderfully made and unique and special, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christy. Y'all have fun in power hour. You will? Glad to hear it. Well, once again, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hillsdale Church. I've got just a couple of announcements for us this morning. We finished up our Disciple Bible Study, um, which has been going for several months. We had a class on Tuesday mornings and a class on Sunday mornings. This Sunday was the last week of Disciple. So we are going to start a new study on the book called Living Our Beliefs by Kenneth Carter. Jerry is once again going to lead this study. I just finished this book, and it is an easy read, but also very enlightening, very interesting. If you've been thinking about joining in on some kind of study here, this would be a good one for you to start with, especially if you're around for part of the summer. So um, it's going to go throughout the summer. We'll start this Tuesday morning. If you choose to do the Tuesday morning class, uh, that'll be at 830. Or a week from today, Sunday morning at 8 a.m., it's the same class, so you don't need to go to both. You can choose Tuesday or Sunday, or if you miss a week, you 
couldn't catch the other day. You get the gist. So if you're interested in that, you can just show up. If you have any questions, you can catch me or catch Jerry after service or shoot us an email. Uh, this Wednesday, something even more exciting than a new study is that our youth is having their paint war. So, yes, I heard Shirley went, oh, <laughs> exactly. It's very messy. Um, we invite your children to come dressed in all white if they so choose, and they quite literally throw paint at one another. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. So, um, this is to celebrate our rising sixth graders. So if you had a fifth grader that just finished out the school year, we want to celebrate them. We don't want to scare them, but we can't guarantee that that won't happen with the water guns full of just paint. So have them come. We'll have some snacks, uh, a good time for them to hang out. And again, it's celebrating our rising sixth graders, but it is for sixth through 12th grade. So we'd love to have your student there. Uh, at this time, we are going to read Psalm 139, so I want to invite you guys to turn there in your Bibles, or you can read along on the screen. This is our last week of the sermon series, Reckless Gratitude, where we've been reading different psalms and preaching from this text. So, this morning, we are reading Psalm 139. Again, you're welcome to read along in your own Bible or follow along on the screen. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limit of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, do I not hate who you hate, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for the gift of these words given to us, for their beauty, for the way that they inform our lives. We ask this morning that our hearts would be ground that is soft, ready for you to sow the seed, that we would live fruitful lives that are informed by your word, by your practice, by the truth that you give us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. At this time, I want to invite our ushers forward as we give the gifts of our tithes and our offerings. Your 
Good morning. And welcome to Hillsdale United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us on this Sunday morning as we gather together. Um, ha have you ever had one of those days where everything about your um, walk with the Lord is just going perfect? You're just, you're just doing good. It seems like every move you make, every step, every word, your prayers, everything is just going perfect. And then all of a sudden, something happens and you hit a brick wall and you realize um, something went very, very wrong. I, I got that feeling from the psalmist today. Did you catch it on Psalm 139? I, you know, it's one of my favorite psalms, but uh, I was tempted as we were uh, preparing for this series to cut out the last couple sentences and just read that part that was so incredibly wonderful. I believe the psalmist, whoever it was, David or whoever wrote this psalm, nailed it. I mean, it was like perfect understanding of the wonder of God. God, you know me. You were there when I was formed in my mother's womb. Everything about me, you get me. And I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then all of a sudden, we get to the end, and it seems like uh, Dr. Jekyll has left the room, and in comes Mr. Hyde. Listen to verse 19. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God. And that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh God? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. What does that mean? Have you ever thought about perfect hatred? in our Bible. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The, the psalmist has, has some um, hang-ups, doesn't he or she? Really doesn't like certain people and wants to get that in to this wonderful, exquisite, perfect song, this perfect psalm, and then, and then goes into this tirade about the enemies and his or her enemies and how wicked they are and how he hates them. And then does something that I find a little bit amusing at the end. If I'm wrong about this, God, you, look, you search me, you test me. If I'm wrong, you let me know. <laughs> Did you pick up on that? That's the way he ended the psalm. It's just one of those psalms that you want to read the first half and not the last few words. You know what is interesting about this? This is Old Testament. We know that things changed with Jesus. And this is one of the major things one of the most incredible shifts in our understanding of God happens with this very thought and this very process of our human condition. You know, all of the Psalms are written from the human perspective. That's why we are um, so inclined to read them and to connect to them in such a powerful way. They're our words, they're our expressions. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, I know you're with me. You see, we're saying things to God in the Psalms. And here is just an outpouring of our human condition. Things did change with Jesus. Because what we know perfectly well is that when God sent Jesus into the world, Jesus came for everybody, including 
those enemies that we hate with perfect hatred. God sent Jesus, his only begotten son, into this world. And he so loved this world. And things changed because of Jesus, especially this notion of will you kill all of my enemies, God? Will you just wipe them off the face of the earth? They don't like you either. You need to get them. Let's get them together. And if I'm wrong on this, you let me know. God lets us know. God told us. <laughs> I, I find it interesting. I, as Tori said, we finished out disciple class uh, today, and it's, it's always interesting. Oh, and by the way, I'm thinking to myself, boy, now there's a contrast. Uh, you can start this Bible study with our pastor, or you can come to a paint war. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I want to go to the paint war. <laughs> One of the things I did with the class today was I talked about how we are all called to the mission field and how we are all ministers and we're all missionaries. And I gave them this handout. I want to just share it with you. I found it to be very interesting. It, it gives um, tradition, how tradition holds what happened to all of the disciples and how they lived their lives after the resurrection and after Pentecost and how they moved through life together as um, Christ followers. Matthew. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia, killed by a sword wound. Mark. Mark died in Alexandria, Egypt after being dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke. Luke was hanged in Greece as the result of his tremendous preaching to the lost. John. John faced martyrdom when he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil during a wave of persecution in Rome. However, he was miraculously delivered from death. John was then sentenced to the mines on the prison island of Patmos he wrote his prophetic book of Revelation on Patmos. The Apostle John was later freed and returned to serve as a bishop in modern-day Turkey. He died as an old man, the only disciple to die peacefully. Peter, Peter was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross. According to church tradition, it was because he told his tormentors that he felt unworthy to die in the same way that Jesus Christ had died. James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was thrown off a hundred foot drop from the southeast pinnacle of the temple when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Um, this was the same temple point, by the way, that uh, the devil tempted Jesus in the, in the scriptures of his temptation. James the Great, son of Zebedee, was a fisherman by trade when Jesus called him to a lifetime of ministry. As a strong leader of the church, James was ultimately beheaded at Jerusalem. The Roman officer who guarded James watched in amazement as James defended his faith at his trial. Later, the officer walked beside James to the place of execution. Overcome by conviction, he declared his new faith to the judge and knelt beside James to accept beheading as a Christian. Bartholomew, also known as Daniel, was a missionary to Asia. <clears throat> he witnessed our Lord, he witnessed for our Lord in present day Turkey. Bartholomew was martyred for his preaching in Armenia when he was flagged to death by a whip. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Patras, Greece, after being whipped severely by seven soldiers, they tied his body to the cross with cords to prolong his agony. His followers reported when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it with these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the blood of Christ Jesus and his body hanging on it. He continued to preach to his tormentors, 
for two days on that cross until he expired. Thomas, one we know as Doubting Thomas, was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips to establish the church in the subcontinent. Jude was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Matthias, the one that was chosen to take Judas's place, was stoned and then beheaded. Paul was tortured and then beheaded by the evil Emperor Nero in Rome in A.D. 67. You know, just reading about the traditional thoughts of what happened to all of those disciples and what happened in their life. I mean, this, this was the same group of men that were scattered in the midst of Jesus' um, trial and, and, and being uh, whipped and carrying his cross uh, to Calvary and then being crucified. They were all over the place hiding in fear. And yet these are the same disciples who found the power and the witness and the courage to become missionaries all over the world, the known world for them, to their enemies. Every single one of them perished at the hands. And even John, they tried to kill him, perished at the hands of their enemies. Things changed with Jesus. Everything changed with Jesus. You know, I am, I am so um, particularly um, strengthened in our church as a church family as I constantly kind of go back to what we say we're doing here, why we're here. What is our purpose? What is our mission? And our mission, if you don't know it, is very simple. We have a twofold mission. We're going to pursue God and we're going to love all people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I am particularly encouraged that we, from the beginning of this particular body of believers coming together, we capitalize that word all. We're going to love all people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's important to us. You see, I believe that God sent Jesus into this world for everybody. Not just for a select few, not just for a particular group, ethnic group or racial group, but for everyone, for all people. And so it is, it is something for us to consider as we think about the world we live in and as we consider the challenges that we face today. As we were concluding our last class in Disciple, we talked about what does ministry look like for us and, and what does the mission of the church become for us in 2022. I've been interested in changes as a pastor, changes that have happened recently. I've certainly seen changes within my lifetime. And I, I looked this week at a, a study that was conducted by the Barna Group. This is one of those professional groups that do, they, they survey Christians and, and communities and they do it very well and they're very reputable. And we've used them off and on at Hillsdale uh, over the years. So I looked at what the Barna Group says is going on within the Christian church, not just Methodist or Baptist or Catholic, or, but the world Christian church. What's happening and is happening in the last 25 years? Now, we, they stopped short of COVID, by the way. They went from the 90s up to uh, 2020. Because if you throw the last couple of years with COVID, it's going to really kind of skew the numbers. But it was disappointing. It was extremely disappointing to look at those trends that are taking place in the Christian church, especially when it comes to attendance at church. 
worship experiences and membership within the Christian church and how people align themselves in their uh, thoughts of faith and belief and practice. And almost across the board, for the last 25 years, this was an easy statistic for me to remember, for the last 25 years, we've declined 25%, which is pretty substantial within our setting, within, within North America, a 25% decline in the Christian faith. It was, it's quite, quite dramatic. Attendance was probably a little bit more than, than 25%. And that 25% that has been part of the decline or the loss in the Christian church, um, Barna does a good job of trying to say, where did they go? What, did they move to a different faith practice? Did they do something different in their mindset, in their worldview? And what they say is that that 25% reduction in numbers uh, is from people just, they're not going any particular place. They're just kind of disaffiliating as Christians. They no longer profess Christian, Christianity as a Christian faith, as what they believe. So that's, that's troubling. And it, it's also, I think, redefining for us as the church, as we think about our purpose as we think about loving all people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that look like for us here at Hillsdale? Do you think that we probably have had those same kind of declines in our backyard? I, I believe so. I believe our backyard is the mission field and that we need to wake up to that Reality. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with us sending missionaries globally around the world. I think that's an important thing for us to do, and we do that. United Methodist Church has a presence everywhere, and I think that's a strong witness for Christ to be in Ukraine. I mean, we were in Ukraine before the war broke out. We were already there. We were, we were established in ministry and doing good work in Ukraine long before the current conflict. That's a good thing. But what I'm troubled by and concerned about is what's happening in our neighborhood? What's happening to the faith of our children and our grandchildren and those who live around us? What's, what's happening in our mission field, our backyard? You know, the, the, the encouraging thing that I saw uh, in those statistics, and, and it's hard to find any encouragement, that there were two factors that jumped out at me that have not changed in the last 25 years within the group that was surveyed. And I think it's important for us to take note of these two things. First of all, the percentage of people who read their Bible stayed the same over the course. Even though attendance, church membership, all of those things, even that kind of big group of disaffiliation from the church that I was telling you about, all that happened on a tremendous uh, numerical scale. But people, same percentage of people read their Bibles. Also, one thing that stayed the same was people praying. So, we still have a strong presence of searching the scriptures, even though it's not in church or in community, and prayer, even though that as well is not in church or not in community. What does that say to us about the mission field? Our backyards. Whenever you prepare as a missionary to go into the mission field, you do two things. Primarily two things. You learn a new language, right? Because chances are you're going to a place where you don't speak the language. And the second thing is you learn a new culture. You try to understand the culture that you're being sent to. I would add a third thing in our day and age 
of going out into the mission field is you learn a new technology. You learn a new technology. Now, here's what I think is interesting for us as people of faith in this church and in this community. We need to learn a new language. What our neighbors are saying and doing and speaking. We need to learn a new culture. Listen, it's a different world than we grew up in. Most of us. It's a new way of thinking. It's a new culture. It's a new dynamic. And it's certainly a need for us to learn the new technologies. It was kind of uh, an eye-opening thing for me last week. Um, Tori and Noah attended and we hosted um, a baccalaureate service here at Hillsdale, which is where the church comes together and recognizes uh, graduates from high school and they have a speaker who brings a message, a witness, and scripture is read and songs and things are said and we're just there to encourage those uh, graduates. You know how many graduates were at our baccalaureate service like Sunday night? You know how many kids were at the pool party next to my house last Sunday night? At least a hundred. So I'm starting a movement this morning. We need to build a pool. <laughs> we need to put it right down beside the baptismal um, pool. And we need to hire some lifeguards. And it, it's a new language that's being spoken. It's a new culture. And it certainly is a new technology. And the mission field, folks, is our backyard. And the people of that mission field are our enemies sometimes. They are the ones, just like all of the disciples, that may want to even threaten our lives. I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't want any part of what you believe. Sometimes that gets quite aggressive. It makes us uncomfortable. But it is our purpose. Our purpose is to love all people. And God changed the rules with Jesus. And he said, all people means all people. My, a good friend of mine, a colleague in ministry out in Texas, he, he, he was sharing uh, with his congregation recently. And there, you know, we live in kind of a polarized uh, culture and society. And, and he was trying to make a point in his message. He said, everybody is welcome in this church. Everybody is welcome in this church. The only people who aren't welcome in this church are the people who don't want to welcome everybody. I get that. I get that point. I understand that. We are called to give witness to the world, the world around us. And listen, listen the first time you say anything is probably not going to go over very well. But it's about building a relationship. It's about learning a new language. It's about immersing oneself in the culture and the technology to understand and to recognize that God is calling us something, calling us to something that is so much bigger than we even know. And we might be just like the psalmist. Okay, I understand how wonderful you are, oh God. I understand how I am made and I understand how you are with me. But would you help me kill with perfect hatred my enemy? If I'm wrong in this, you let me know. He let us know. He showed us as clear as could be shown that we're wrong about that. You know, right after uh, Jesus died and after that initial outpouring of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, the church began to grow and immediately problems arose. Tori is developing a sermon series for us in the next few weeks where we walk through those early chapters of Acts and what happened with the church and how, how it defined who we are today, what they did. In the beginning, you know, in the beginning, this was a Jewish faith. 
and there were Jewish men who were organizing it and setting up the rules and regulations. And what they said from the outset was, this is for Jewish people. We have enemies. We have people we don't like. We have people that don't like us. And so let's surround the wagons. Let's make this what God intended it to be. They called themselves the Jerusalem Council. They had conferences. They set up rules. Here's how you do this. Here's who you devoid. Here's where you go. Here's where you don't go. And then Paul comes along. And Jesus has to intervene again. Jesus appears to the apostle Paul and he says, you're, you're doing wrong, Saul. And this is for everybody and you must go to the ends of the world and you must tell of my love and love people into a relationship, all people. Paul begins to do that and he begins to plant churches. He's very effective with it and there is a tension that grows between Paul and the Jerusalem council because he's going way beyond the boundaries of Jewish people and they're mad about it. They tell him to stop. Paul says, I'm not going to stop. Not only am I not going to stop, I'm not going to follow your rules and regulations. See, they wanted people, okay, we'll bend this much. If somebody who is a Gentile wants to be a Christian, they got to become Jewish first. And once, they, once they're circumcised, once they're part of our community, once we accept them in, then we will allow them to explore Christianity. And Paul said, no way. I'm not saying that. And, and his, his ministry and his mission and all the church plants just began to explode. He went to a place called Antioch early. In, and by the way, Antioch is where we were first called Christian. It's where the term came from. Jesus didn't say go into the world and make Christians. But the culture gave us that name in Antioch. Antioch had 500,000 people in it. You know, when I think about history and I think about this era of Jesus and the disciples, I think of small, little, quaint, little huts and sand. And, but 500,000 people lived in Antioch and Paul began to witness to the love of Christ Jesus and was very effective at it. So effective at it that the Jerusalem council sent a spy Go up there to Antioch and see what he's doing. We don't approve of it. We got to figure out what it is this man is doing. You know who they sent? A guy by the name of Barnabas. And we know that Barnabas became Paul's partner. He joined in his efforts and together the two of them went on all kinds of missionary journeys and did so much for the kingdom. Finally, ultimately, God got a hold of everybody in the Jerusalem council and Peter had to come around. It took him a little bit longer as well, but ultimately God's will, you see, it is God's will, it is God's desire that our enemies and all people come to know Jesus Christ. It's why we have to welcome everyone. That's why we have to be open. It's how we have to learn from this experience of the early church and recognize that this isn't ours. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. And he gave Jesus to all of us. And he said, pray this prayer. Thy kingdom come, O God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven with all people. What does your backyard look like? I imagine it's a little bit like my backyard. I imagine there's all sorts of people around you and all sorts of people you know, and they may be good friends. They may be family members who have disaffiliated want nothing to do with even the thought of where their faith lies or 
what the rest of their journey might look like. God is calling us to the mission field. God is asking us to take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and be creative with fresh expressions and new ways and new technology and new approaches to love people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. One one of the quotes that I love to end disciple with, I I always do this, Um, I am particularly taken by a devotional written by Sarah Young. Maybe you know it, it's called Jesus Calling. If you don't have a copy of Jesus Calling, get you one. There's a couple out on our uh, little library shelf and we have more copies if you're interested, but Sarah Young writes this devotional and she writes it from the perspective of Jesus is speaking to us through these words. And there's one particular um, quote that I always end disciple with because the end of disciple is the sending forth, the great commission to go into the world and our backyards. Here's this quote, as if this is Jesus speaking to us. Do not blindly follow your habitual route or you will miss what I have prepared for you. Well, that's our temptation, isn't it? We find habits of contentment. We find habits of expressing ourselves in worship and even within the identity of what we call church. And that that quote just kind of nails me and convicts me at the heart of the matter. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Should we hang on to baccalaureate services or should we have some pool parties and share the love of Christ Jesus around the swimming pool? I say whatever it takes to make a fresh expression in a world that is drifting away from their desire or concern or understanding of how important God is to not only these few short years that we live here but for all eternity for all eternity go and spread the good news of Christ and his love to all people and everyone who's welcome In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you stand up as we sing our closing song together? There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. Oh, you are Never been anyone like you Never been anyone like you
You know, we sang that song 50 years ago. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good to me. What a wonderful example of how we can take what is at our center. It never changes, does it? The gospel doesn't change. The world around us changes in some ways. And we have to be there. To say to a world that is lost and hurting, God is so good. God is so good. Would you receive this benediction? Go into the world, all the world. Go into your backyards and tell the world that is lost and hurting about the love of Christ Jesus that you have discovered. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.